the fence line. So you can come on up to the fence line if you like. Go for it. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, I'd like to take uh, this opportunity that I have uh, to welcome you all to Gettysburg, welcome you here to um, uh, our Living History program. Um, we're very fortunate uh, here at Gettysburg to have invited, have accepted into the park the best Living History groups in the nation uh, to give their time uh, give up their expertise, give up their weekends for you folks. Uh, this uh, morning here at five or here at eleven o'clock, we do have uh, the Fifth U.S. Cavalry in here. Uh, these people uh, volunteer their time to be here with you, uh, and without them, we wouldn't have any type of living history program at all for you. So uh, we're very fortunate that we have uh, the best. In my estimation, in most uh, parks' estimation, the best uh, uh, Calvary group to demonstrate a little bit about the role and function of Calvary for you. Uh, they're also going to be uh, uh, showing you the different accoutrements and so forth and talk a little bit about Calvary in general. Um, so, I am going to introduce to you uh, a person that's been coming into Gettysburg uh, uh, for years. Also, you've seen him on A&E, the History Channel. Uh, he's uh, one of the premier consultants, uh, not only uh, uh, Calvary, but also uh, military in general. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he is also uh, a very good friend of mine and uh, will do a wonderful job. And, um, and uh, So I'm going to just introduce him and then kick back and enjoy it too. Uh, I'd like to turn the program over to Mr. Tom Williams. Huh? Hey, Tom. All right, guys, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I to welcome you here to the Gettysburg National Battlefield. As Tom said, I've been up here doing interpretive programming along with some people uh, for too many years to count now, probably in excess of uh, 20. Uh, and what we're going to be demonstrating and talking to you about a little bit today is the use of the mounted service during the American Civil War. Before we actually start talking about the role of cavalry and getting into some of the tactics used here at Gettysburg, let's regress a little bit. Now, what you see in front of you, like, it was a small attempt at representative of what the United States regular Army Cavalry Mounted Service had developed into by Gettysburg. Very streamlined, very scaled down to a fighting force. But this wasn't necessarily all the case, uh, always the case. Prior to the American Civil War, the Mounted Service was, although the most heavily armed, was one of the smallest services used in the United States. And uh, it was used primarily for patrolling and scouting. In fact, prior to the Civil War, by its European standards are like that, the amounted service in the United States Army numbered just a little over 3,000 men going into the American Civil War, but was actually divided up into three separate branches of service. Now, whether your persuasion is either northern or southern or like that, what I'm going to be talking about, and as I talk, you'll understand why, all the tactics and the equipment used and the basic concepts with a mounted soldier, regardless of the Union Confederate, were the same. But the American Civil War was, in fact, a civil war. In fact, most of the officers that uh, were some of the premier officers of the uh, Confederate service were trained at West Point. They had received their experience in the West fighting for the United States Army. Uh, for example, uh, as Tom said, we represent a detachment of the 5th Regiment of the United States Regular Cavalry. In the days prior to the Civil War, that was the old 2nd United States Cavalry. It had a very, very uh, uh, strong history behind it. It was formed in 1855 as part of Jefferson Davis' own. At the time, he was Secretary of War for the United States. And along with the 1st uh, United States Cavalry, which eventually became the 4th, they were formed as an elite mounted service to augment the three existing regiments uh, of cavalry uh, that were in the United States service at the time. 
Now, regressing even more, in 1833, there was a need. At that time, we had no standing mounted service in the United States Army. But there was a need in the Western Territories for mounted troops to be able to patrol our territories and protect the citizens uh, uh, in the Western Territories. At that time, the Western Territories was considered anything west of the Mississippi. So in 33 and 34, there were regiments of dragoons. And by European standards, these were soldiers that were trained to fight both on foot and horseback equally as well, being very uh, diverse in their capabilities. And these pretty much uh, defended our territories up until the um, uh, Mexican-American War in the late 1840s. And during that time, the Army felt a need for an additional mounted service known as mounted rifles. This was a group of uh, horsemen that used long arms and actually used the horse for rapid transportation and dismounted and did most of their fighting on foot. These pretty much remained status quo up until 1855 when the expansion of our territories saw the need for additional mounted troops. Infantry was not capable of covering the vast territories uh, in the West that were being settled by uh, American settlers, so they felt that they needed more mounted troops to do this. Uh, so the two regiments of cavalry were formed. When they were formed in 1855, the old 2nd Cavalry, the 5th which we represent, had several distinguished officers put in its command. Its commanding officer, the colonel promoted in charge of the regiment, was an am named Albert Sidney Johnson. I'm sure any of you done this reading about the American Civil War have heard of him. But more prominently than a name that I'm sure all of you have heard was a young captain. At the time, he was the captain of engineers, and because of his prowess and demonstrated abilities, uh, was promoted over several senior officers and promoted to lieutenant colonel of cavalry as the second in command of the old second cavalry. His name was Robert E. Lee. In fact, he stayed prominent with the regiment all the way up to the beginning of the Civil War and actually was offered command of the entire Union armies before he resigned his commission at the beginning of the Civil War. In fact, before all was said and done, 17 of the officers that were associated with the, uh, the 5th Cavalry alone eventually resigned their commissions and became general officers in the Confederacy. So as you can see, they took with them their knowledge and their expertise and experience so to train the Southern Cavalry in very much the same skills as the Northern Cavalry did. Now, there's a lot of myths and uh, stories that have developed about the Southern Cavalry and its uh, uh, fighting against the North, but in reality, they were pretty much a mirror image. They used the same basic weaponry. As I said, the cavalry, although one of the smallest branches of the service, was the most heavily armed. They were armed and equipped uh, as much as technology would allow, the same as what their unit counterpart was. Now, the cavalryman was equipped with the, uh, actually four separate weapons and distinct weapons at his disposal, unlike the infantryman that merely had a rifle with a bayonet mounted on the end of it uh, to uh, uh, function in battle. The cavalryman, on the other hand, had four weapons. And because in 1861, because of expenses and budget cutbacks, and we all know what that's about, we see that even today, they consolidated all these various separate mounted services into a single service called cavalry. Now, like that. So this meant that by the beginning of the Civil War, the average horse soldier, both Union and Confederate, had to do all the varying jobs that each of these individual branches had to do prior to the war. He had to be uh, proficient on horseback fighting in mass numbers. He had to be proficient of dismounting and being able to fight on foot. He had to be proficient in scouting and patrolling and all the other various duties that the, the horse soldier was used uh, for throughout the American Civil War. This in turn, in reality, traded, the, uh, traded off in the fact that it took upward to two years for a cavalryman to be adequately trained in his skills. So at the beginning of the American Civil War, as I said before, with less than 3,000 mounted troops in the United States Army, most of those deployed in the Western Theater, all of a sudden the Union Army had to raise a brand new, untested, untrained mounted force. The Confederate counterparts, on the other hand, as the war uh, started, and like that, came from an agrarian society. And like that, they were used to riding horses on a regular basis, and they were a martial society. That meant they had many more mounted militia units that could be called upon to eventually form the Confederate States Mounted Service. And like that, so horsemen for horsemen, uh, other than the regular army services like that, who uh, were professional soldiers, like that, the average Confederate horseman, and I'll use the term horseman, not cavalryman, the average Confederate horseman was much better versed as an equestrian than what his Union counterpart was. But as the war progressed, the Union cavalry went through two years of hard knocks learning the job. And one of the big things that eventually became a deciding force this cavalry, as we go along and talk about tactics, is not dependent as much on the prowess of the individual cavalrymen as it is of the teamwork used as cavalry functioning as a team in the linear tactics being used at the time. So this was very, very important on how the cavalry trained. So by 1863, that cavalry that was basically stored and uh, put down by Confederate cavalry for the first two years of the war was standing its own. As you see behind me, a minor deploying and like that, we'll talk a little bit about some of the weapons that were used by these cavalry. 
I like that. And then we'll go back about and talk about some of the tactics that were eventually deployed here in Gettysburg. Now, as I said, there were four distinct, uh, distinct weapons used by the cavalry. The first and foremost of which, contrary to what people might believe, is what I'm sitting on, the horse. This was not a transportation item for the cavalry. This was, in fact, a weapon. The mounted soldier depended on this animal. In fact, each cavalry developed, uh, developed a very extreme bond with this animal. And in many cases, the idea of what you've seen in movies going galloping from point A to point B to get there was only done in dire emergency. The average pace going from a battlefield to a battlefield or moving from point A to point B by the cavalry was a walk. Many times, dismounting and leading his horse, marching just as much as what the infantry did in an effort to preserve this animal. You also notice that what we have to live with, both for the horse and ourselves, is packed everything on the saddle. It's cut down to the bare minimum necessities, again, trying to save the animal because where he was needed was in combat. If he fails in combat because he's too fatigued, then he has not accomplished his mission. Now, on horseback, the cavalryman was probably most known for the use of the saber. The weapons that you see behind you, oh! Saber! Are the 1840 and 1860 light cavalry saber that was being used by the time by the Federal Services. Now, these weapons they have a history that goes all the way back to the uh, Middle Ages, and have been designed and used specifically on use for horseback. It was, in fact, a slashing and cutting weapon, not a stabbing weapon. You know, it's in design, it was uh, designed like a scimitar, slightly curved, but it was not kept sharp during the entire length of the blade. It was only kept sharp the last six to eight inches, using the momentum of the horse and the swing of the arm and the weight of the blade to actually strike it against the opponent using a full swing. Now, again, the cavalryman was not given this weapon to go out and indiscriminately hack and slash against his opponent. He was taught to use this weapon the exact same way that a fencer would be taught to use a fencing foil today. There were very distinct movements, each having its own design and own usage. And before he was put into combat, he went through stages learning the use of these weapons one at a time by command. He was first taught to use these movements on foot. You're probably wondering if it's a weapon that was designed to use on horseback, why use them on foot? Well, the army had a very aversion running around with horses without ears, so they figured they'd teach the cavalry how to use the saber first before we put him on horseback. Then, after the fact, they would teach him how to ride. But the cavalryman, once he was taught how to ride, taught how to use the saber separately, they were then put in combination, taught these distinctive movements one at a time, and then eventually go up through riding at uh, fixed targets, fencing with each other, ultimately using them in the uh, final usage of the saber in the charge, as we'll talk about later. Now, again, these uh, movements had very distinct purposes. Guard! When the parade room, uh, ground movement of carry saber a position of guard was gone into. Now, this would be automatic in combat when actually engaging uh, an enemy soldier. The idea behind it, it brought the weapon in a neutral position so it could be taken in any direction in any movement as needed. Now, the first group of movements we'll show you, again, will be done instinctively and automatically in combat, but were, uh, were taught by command so it became reflex for the soldier. Now, these first group of movements are what are known as parries, and these were used to ward off the blow of various types of weapons against the cavalryman. The head! Parry! Left, parry. Right, parry. In tears, parry. In court, parry. Now these were normally followed up with two different types of attack movements. One was known as the point. Now this was actually a stabbing movement. As I said, this weapon was not necessarily designed for this. And for very practical reasons. If you can imagine, in a charge or moving at full speed, the average horse is going to be moving anywhere from 20 to 30 miles an hour. If he's going up against an opponent also on horseback, that speed has now increased 40 to 60 miles an hour as they engage. If you can imagine using this as a stabbing weapon, physically thrusting into your opponent as he rides by, you're not going to have time to draw the weapon clear. So in many cases, you could very well stand a chance of being dehorsed yourself or losing your weapon. So this was only used when they're in very tight confinements, pretty much at a standstill at a melee, but it was very, very effective in very close quarters. Right, point. Left, point. The rear, point. In tears, point. In court, point. Against infantry, right, point. Against infantry, left, point. These were normally followed up by the movement that was most used by the saber, and these were the cuts. Again, like I said, the blade was only kept sharp the last six to eight inches, top and bottom. You can imagine there's well over three pounds of steel in the blade of this weapon alone, and a man's full arm swing, the momentum of a horse, it could make a very decided weapon against an opponent. 
literally not only striking through leather, but through uh, uh, flesh and bone as well. It functioned exactly the same way a meat cleaver would. So it could be very, very devastating in combat. Right, cut. Left, cut. The rear, cut. Front, cut. Now you notice even on the front cut, I like that I actually hesitated as we went through, as my men did. Again, the cavalryman had to be very well reversed to the use of this weapon, not using it like a club. Because you remember, this is not just parade ground movements. This is actual combat. And the man he's going up against is trying to do unto him as he's doing unto them. And if he swung through and didn't have full control of this weapon, in fact, the 40 heavy that I'm carrying was referred to as the troopers as the old wrist breaker because they had to develop a very subtle wrist to be able to control the weapon. The idea in a front cut, for example, if I came up against an opponent, swung at him, missed, and allowed the weapon to control me instead of me control the weapon, and follow through, what have I done? I've left myself wide open for him to do unto me. So the idea is the trooper had to be able to control that weapon if he missed, immediately bring it back up into an offensive posture, or bring it back up into a mode that he could strike against these enemies. So he had to full, have absolute and full control of this weapon. And it took time and practice to develop that. Carry, saber, return, saber. As our men move off in position, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other weapons used. March. Now, one of the weapons used by the cavalry was the exclusive to the mounted service. It was really uh, new to the military anyway, only starting to see action as early as the Mexican War, only 20 years before. And that's the revolving pistol sidearm. This particular one, the cavalry right, was the only two. service that actually March. carried revolvers by all ranks, privates all the way up to officers. And it was considered a defensive weapon. This particular weapon is a Colt 1860 Army revolver. And although it looks like a modern firearm with a revolving cylinder carrying six rounds, it was in fact more similar to the infantry weapons being used during the period of the day than it was in fact a modern revolver, in that it did not have a, a fixed cartridge. It actually used loose powder and ball or a pre-made paper cartridge and ball that was loaded from the front of the chamber and just like the infantry rifle, used a built-in rammer to pack the charge home. Once this was done to all six chambers, Again, like the infantry rifle, there's a small nipper or cone in the back that a brass cap contained a substance known as fulminated mercury, just like you would find in a cap gun today when placed on here, thus making the cylinder itself a six-round cartridge in itself. Now, again, if you can imagine, on horseback, that would be a very impractical weapon to try to fire or reload. But the weapon itself, again, was defensive. You notice the way it's carried. It's carried with the butt forward in a heavy flap holster. Designed behind it, if I could drop the reins as I've done now, Use the saber in the right hand in a close melee, be able to parry off the enemy with the saber, draw the revolver literally at point blank range, and be de uh, able to dispatch my opponent. These did not have an accurate range, contrary to what Hollywood has put forward. In reality, like that, accurate range of these pistols, even when standing on the ground, was at best 30 to 40 feet. Some uh, experts with the pistol uh, in today's standards might be able to hit something upward to 25 yards and away, but in reality, they were a very, very short-ranged and, in many cases, very inaccurate weapon. Now, the next weapon that was uh, utilized by the cavalry and it saw prominent use here at Gettysburg was a carbine. Now, this is one of the many carbines that were used by both the North and the South during the American Civil War. It was probably one of the most prominent. This particular weapon is an 1859 Sharps carbine, and it differs from the infantry rifle that was being used during the period in that it was a breech loader. This was something that was fairly unique to the mounted service and dates all the way back before the American Revolution, where uh, they, even then they did have weapons that were breech loading. And what I refer to as breech loading, instead of having to tear the cartridge open with the teeth and pour the powder down the barrel and use a rammer to pack it home, this particular weapon, I could open the block of the weapon, open the rear of it, take a pre-made paper or linen cartridge, load it from the rear of the weapon, close the block, prime it just like I would an empty rifle, be able to bring the weapon up, fire it, and reload without a rammer detaching from the body. This had two decided advantage. It allowed the weapon to be used both on horseback, as you see behind me, and on foot, and it increased the rate of fire. This particular carbine had a rate of fire upward to 8 to 10 times a minute in the hands of a well-trained cavalryman, compared to the average infantry rifle that could only be loaded and fired practically about 3 times a minute. So this proved a decided advantage in the short term. And one thing I'll emphasize here, although heaven forbid any cavalryman may hear me saying this, is cavalry was not excessively functional by itself, but like all the services, Infantry, artillery, and cavalry, they were most useful when working in concert with each other. For example, here at Gettysburg, one of the most prominent parts of the battle, and there was a substantial amount of cavalry action that did take place here. On the very first day, two brigades of the 1st Division under John Buford 
after coming from uh, Brandy Station in Virginia and serving several weeks fighting the Confederates in a rear guard action, ended up on the western side of town, uh, just west of what is now known as McPherson's Ridge. He was first sent out skirmishers, as you see back here, well in advance to feel out what Confederates were in front of him. And the idea for the skirmishers was to take a small amount of cavalrymen, a company or squadron strength, sending them well in advance of the main force, spreading them in open order, and pushing against the opponent. Not with the idea of pushing them back, but merely to ascertain the disposition of the enemy. In this particular case, the carbines could be fired off of horseback, not necessarily to hit the opponent, but merely to drive in their pickets and to see exactly what was facing. After John Buford did this, he saw his pickets return, and then, as you'll see later, use these cavalry to dismount and fight on foot. Techniques taught me as late as the early dragoons and like that to be able to hold off the enemy. The advantage of the carbine with its 8 to 10 rounds per minute allowed less than 2,500 men, one quarter of which were actually dispatched to the rear to hold horses, like that to hold up to much superior Confederate force of infantry until they were relieved by Reynolds Union infantry. Again, this carbine, by all means, was not the most advanced of the time. Technology had drastically advanced the weapon. Although they didn't see prominent use here, by 1864, after the Battle of Gettysburg, this was rapidly being replaced in the Union service by a weapon that was even more to modern technology. It was a repeating weapon that had a tubular magazine in the stock and, like, say, and had a metallic cartridge and a lever action, very similar to what most of you could probably represent as a name that would be familiar to as a Winchester. And this was the Henry rifle, the Henry carbine. There was only a very few of them used here at Gettysburg, but by late 1864, at least one and a half divisions of cavalry in the Union service were completely armed with these weapons. Now, normally what would be done, as John Buford did here on the first day, when cavalry dismounted, they would form on front, usually by squadrons or even by regiment, and then dismount, one man and four staying mounted, the th uh, first, second, and third horses being linked together, bit to halter, bit to halter, literally making augmented rain, so they were now attached together just the same way as a driving team would be attached. The, uh, the fourth man, usually the best rider in the section, is again, the other cavalryman's lives often depend on how well he can manage his horses, but then wheel this set of four around, take it to an area of relative safety to be able to bring the horses up when needed. This technique proved so beneficial, not only had it been used for many, many years before the Civil War, but it remained in use for the United States Cavalry all the way up to the disbandment of cavalry in 1943. So it was a very practical operation. Then the cavalry was able to utilize this carbine as dragoons fighting on foot to lay down a short-term but heavy firepower against the infantry. You'll also notice that the cavalryman, contrary to what Hollywood put forward, is not leaving anything behind in his horse. Every weapon that is issued to the cavalryman was, in fact, carried on the person. They were not strapped to the saddle. The carbine, for example, had a wide over-the-shoulder belt that allowed the carbine to be suspended normally by the right hip. And that way, if it were brought up into action on horseback or on foot, it was never dis uh, detached from the cavalryman's body. It could be loaded and fired while still in place and still attached. The saber was attached to the left hip and suspended by two straps from a specially designed belt. And the revolver itself, something fairly new to the Civil War period, and like that, was actually carried on the person versus to be carried in pommel holes. Again, a note on the revolver while the cavalrymen are moving back into place is contrary to the myths that have built around, Confederate cavalry, unlike Union cavalry, did not carry braces of revolvers versus carrying sabers. The Confederate cavalry was armed with a saber very similar to what the Union were. In reality, there were very, very few cavalrymen that saw the need to carry the extra weight of additional revolvers. The few incidences or exceptions to this were by irregulars, guerrilla fighters such as John Mosby, who would in fact carry two or three revolvers, not the half dozen that some uh, historians have quoted, but merely two or three revolvers and would carry no other weapons with them. They were not going to fight in a piecemeal battle. Their idea was, in a dark road, catching a Union column, sometimes grand, vastly superior in number, but catching them totally by surprise, riding down amongst them, using the revolver at very close quarters, and six rounds per revolver, dispatching as many men as they could, and then turning and fleeing out of the action before the uh, Union force could react. This proved very beneficial, but again, it was a drill attack. It was not the standard practice of the Confederate Army. Now again, the men could move forward and move to the rear, both mounted and dismounted, using a tactic known as phalancy. This allowed them to, in uh, good order, to be able to advance and lay fire tower against the enemy, and even withdraw, still being able to put the same firepower down. This was done either by sections, individuals, or even by uh, uh, squads and platoons on a leapfrogging method. That way at least part of the unit was uh, armed and had the weapons aimed downrange at any given time. Again, as you see, the horse colder could then bring the horses up when necessary, 
allowing the men to remount. As he remounted again by sections, the sections that were mounted would move forward to cover as the rest of the section would remount. This again was all part of the linear tactics that were being used during the period. Again, as my men start to move into position, let's drop back a little bit and talk about some of the most spectacular use of cavalry during the Civil War. And this is something that was used uh, not often, but to great effect during the Civil War when it was used. And that's the use of the saber and the cavalryman in the charge. This is something there's a tremendous amount of myth that's built around and like that. There were several charges, in fact, utilized here at Gettysburg and like that. Some against uh, dismounted troops, some against cavalry versus cavalry. But all pretty much were perpetuated the same. And unlike what Hollywood has put forward and what you may have read about and like that, this was not a pell-mell mad rush of a mob going against the opposing force. It was functioned exactly the same way as it would on a parade ground. Infantry, you did the uh, linear tactics. If you could picture yourself, again, whether you're a persuasion as Union or Confederate, standing on an opposing line, say you're a Confederate or Union infantryman, you're on three ranks deep. The front rank is dealing with the butt of its weapon buried into the ground, bayonet putting forward. Behind you, the second rank is the charge bayonet. Like, say, putting up a solid wall of uh, bayonets in front of you. Shoulder to shoulder. You're forming a wall in the defense. This was the standard linear tactics of the period. The idea to be able to uh, defeat these tactics was to break a hole in this wall, thus exposing what were known as the flanks or ends and rolling them in from the side. This is where cavalry showed its most prowess in doing this both against another mounted force and against infantry. They would start off upward to two miles away if land permitted, so far away that they were going across and behind the nap of the earth. I like that though, which you could see when they finally did form in your line of sight, if woods and ground did not for all uh, disguise them, is all you would see would be a solid wall. And take a single regiment, 500 men approximately like that, 250 men wide, two rank three, like that. These men would be riding stirrup to stirrup, literally touching uh, feet uh, and stirrups together. They would draw sabers, just the same as they were on a parade ground. The rear rank would be a mere two paces behind the front rank. The officers would be in front, the guide odds would be planted to the center of their companies to act as guides as they move forward, and you would again have a solid wall moving against your solid wall. But the idea was this wasn't a vast uh, solid wall. It was only about 250 yards long. And this idea was it was going to move forward, being followed up eventually by its own infantry and being supported by artillery. It would move forward with the sole and express purpose of pointing at you to break a hole in your wall. They would start moving forward. They would be a mile and a half away. Still this solid wall, parade ground moving. They would be at the walk. The soldiers would be at a carry saber, just the same as they were on parade. They would continue to move forward at a mile and a half away or so. Your artillery would open up on it, trying to break holes in that wall. At first using solid shot as they get closer spherical case, bursting over top, trying to dehorse the riders and hopefully more importantly take the horses out of the ranks. The trot would be given, but still this formation would be maintained the same way as it would be on a parade ground. They would continue to move forward. The momentum had picked up, but still the solid wall was maintained, picking a spot in your line, moving toward it. The gallop would be given at about a thousand yards out as you started giving them musket fire. Again, trying to break holes in the line. If a trooper dropped, in many cases the horse was well trained enough, it would maintain its position in the ranks. If a horse went down, it would be immediately replaced by a horseman in the rear ranks, keeping that solid wall. The momentum picked up, but they didn't break ranks. There's still the solid wall moving faster, the momentum being tough. At the gallop, but not a runaway gallop, the solid wall moving forward. They're 500 yards away, 400, 300. <laughs> 200, barely a single football, 100 yards away. All of a sudden, they're 50 yards away, no more than the distance just beyond those trees. All of a sudden, the charge would be given, the huzzah would go up, the front rank would come to an interior point, the rear rank to a high cut, and the horses would be given their head, bursting forward as much as 25 miles an hour. A solid wall of horses, not a mob, but a solid, concise rank, well-disciplined, well-trained, and they're heading straight for you. You're standing in the ranks. What's going to be your first reaction? To run. <laughs> that is exactly what they're hoping for. Because you have done the worst possible thing to do under those conditions. The only way to stand against a charge like that is stay alive. You break and run, you're now an individual. You've now created that very hole they wanted you to create in their line. So instead of a solid wall, you have broken lines with exposed flanks. They pursue through the part of the line that is broken, saber them down. And immediately behind them comes our infantry, starting to roll up the front. All of a sudden, your solid wall defense deteriorates, and you've lost the battle. I like that. That was why cavalry was used. Now, if you can use your imagination again, this is merely one small section of cavalry. But even then, 
Each one of these men mounted on a thousand pounds of horse flesh carrying three feet of cold steel, sweeping across the front of you. Just a small number will give you a little bit of a feel of what it was like to stand against the cavalry charge. You're anxious. You want to go play, don't you? Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> Gentlemen, you probably have a multitude of questions we haven't covered yet, and we'd like to see the equipment and talk to the men up close. Instead of me standing up here and answering questions, what I'm going to do next. Between uh, modern tech equipment and Civil War tech equipment, federal issue. This is a uh, McClellan, uh, McClellan saddle, 1858 McClellan saddle. See how deep well it sits compared to like a Western saddle. It'll be and, uh, a lot of people think it's uncomfortable, Savage Turn. But it, you sit so deep into the saddle that you're, you're very comfortable. And then you have all your equipment on board, which this is my overcoat. This is just a poncho. I left my blanket and stuff back because I didn't want to get it wet because I have to sleep here tonight. You know, we do do things a little bit different. And, uh, what this last typical night. soldier carrying I was a, carrying extra shirt, you know, underwear drawers, and your saddlebags, extra around. ammunition. Well, you have another bedroll in the back, oh, possibly I'm another blanket <laughs> underneath this blanket. Now, we don't do this that. is a government issue horse blanket. You would have a sleeping blanket put underneath here to save space. And you'd have your haversack on here, and your nose bag, and all that kind of stuff. Why? Because you said it's not and this is, I said this is my overcoat, which can act as another uh, blanket. <laughs> yeah, right. But as far as what the uh, bridle, see, these are these are ex what they call extreme bits. On these, where most riders today use what they call a snaffle bit, which is a little chain broken in the middle. These have a straight bar with a depending upon the temperament of the horse as to how severe the bit is. Number three bit is very severe. It's real high, and as soon as you pull back on the reins, what it does is pulls up with his, roof of his mouth. And, and this is a military halter. Which is a, but that's about the extent of it. And when we link together, we use what we call a link strap. This goes from bit to halter ring to each horse so that the man on the horseback has control. What was the average lifespan today? Turnover. Three years. Three years. Uh, depending, depending upon how active the unit was, you'd lose a horse just through. In the, the one regiment that I do a lot of research on is the Seventh Pennsylvania Cavalry, and they fought in the Western Theater. And during the Atlanta campaign, in one three-week period, they rode 340 horses to death because of lack of forage and the conditions. For us. Oh, I mean a regular trooper? Yeah. It depended upon how... They were specially you, I, you wouldn't draw a horse that you keep on the long side. Battle wounds. You get shot. You know, most times you charge somebody, they're going to shoot at the horse. They just have to horse over. Look around and buy. I got the sharps from the Navy Army. But he was a good horse. This guy is a real good horse. He's a good company. They went out of business. Regiment was normally divided from the beginning of the Civil War. Regiment was here one time. They fired camp. These were to combine. This is a lot of water. Two companies each. And if you can imagine, 
We have a regimental oh, commander. He's with the squad. He's squad. He's squad. He's squad. fighting for the regiment. Well, actually, well, if you saw the hill, the saddle has a deep cut in the center of it. But a lot of people don't realize that that was four. It was four as the horses lose weight through no lack of forage and attrition. The saddle constantly conforms to the horse's back. Whereas a western saddle is solid and you would get a lot of sores and rubs and stuff of that nature. And as far as equipment, we all carry the Sharps carbine. Yeah, we'll be back around 3 o'clock. I carry a, we normally carry a 44 a Colt, and I brought a 36 Colt with me today. Not like, uh, I think there was something, we were just laughing at coming over here, something on the History Channel about the cavalry the other day, and they said Confederate soldiers carried up to eight pistols on themselves. I was thinking, where would you carry eight pistols? <laughs> two on the horse, two on you, two on the back, you know? I don't know who thought that one up, but sometimes they get a little wild with their interpretation of uh, stuff. As far as uh, the amount of ground a cavalry unit could cover compared to infantry in a, a set given of amount of time, what what would be a comparison? Easily, where an infantry unit could cover two miles, we could cover 15 to 20 miles. And as far as uh, uh, an average uh, amount of ground covered going into a battle, you know, obviously they never know when a battle might erupt, but uh, how much ground would a cavalry or, or distance would the horse still be fresh? Well, that depends. <laughs> Depends upon how well he was fed prior to going into action, how well watered they were, all the different uh, aspects of that. But uh, normally, I would say, uh, not really. Hard use, you couldn't go more than three, four hours. Because you're carrying so much water. That's the thing, you know, your weight and then the weight of all your equipment on the horse. In the very beginning of the war, you know, they utilized the horse, you know, the cavalry as scouts and couriers and things of that nature. And they didn't really do many big charges until they, they, well, out west they did some charging. The unit I was saying about the 7th Pennsylvania Cavalry, they were known as the Saber Brigade because they did something contrary to what Tom said. They, they sharpened their sabers from, hill, from tip to hill and it brought out a lot of dis disagreement from the Confederates and the fact that they did this unethical type of They got the nickname the Saber Regiment. But they made three distinct charges which are probably some of the most interesting charges. They charged through a place called Lebanon, Tennessee, right down the center of town. They charged through Shelbyville, Tennessee, which is one of the most amazing. 2,000 troopers in column of fours charging down the main drag of the street, so you can imagine that. And the Confederates had artillery mounted, set in the middle of the town, on a little level in the town square. And what happened was, when they fired, they went over top, because of their elevation versus the guys riding up the road, the rounds went over. I have letters and diaries of this charge where they were completely amazed by the fact that nobody got killed, you know, right off the bat. And they sabered and ran and ran these guys right off out of shell. Joe Wheeler was the Confederate who was there, and they chased him right into the, to the town. I can't remember what the river is there. Right into that, the Duck River. And he jumped his horse and bunched on him drowned. It's a really neat charge if you ever want to read about a charge. But then again, here back in the east, we had Brandy Station. Now, can you picture? I mean, we're only six or seven of us here, but think of you 2,000 guys charging across the field. The sound of that must have made was unbelievable. How, how uh, long or how far can a horse, and a cavalry horse, sustain a full gallop? Because you see in the movies, they're just running for days and stuff like that. No, they can't do that. <laughs> I, I would say at a full gallop, about 15, 15 minutes you could keep them going at it. Then they're going to start fading. I know, this guy's good for uh, seven, five to seven minutes, and then he's going to fade out at a full gallop. But that's a lot of stress on him. And he's a he's a good one. He's a walker. He's a Tennessee walker, which is a little bit different than everybody else's quarter horse. You know, where everybody else sits here doing this stuff. When the walker is sitting doing this. So it's, it's a much nicer ride, you know. A lot easier on the butt. At the beginning of the war, uh, they pretty much pressed any horse flesh into, you know, into the units they could get. And then toward the end, they got more selective uh, as to what a quality cavalry horse was. What, what would you look for? And uh, as far as a quality horse compared to just your average horse? Well, 
Well, there would be a lot of things they would look for, mainly the teeth, for one thing. They had, as like any or anything, even today, you had graft in the, the time, and they were selling bad horses to the U.S. Army. When you wonder, when you begin to wonder that there was 15,000 horses died at Gettysburg alone, something of that nature, 20,000 horses died here. You had uh, to get a good horse at a remount station and have the contractor that did the, the selling of the horses to the government. There was a there's a lot of stuff written about that that I read that was a problem. But the cavalry had the best choice of all the horses. The latter went back to the supply wagons or to the artillery. And a broken down cavalry horse usually wound up pulling wagons and a, and a commissary sergeant or stuff like that. What are you going to do when you were constantly on the move? You, they didn't certainly perform veterinary work. I mean, minor flesh wounds, they would leave them alone and give them rest. But uh, any chest wound, if you make the big horse down, broken leg, he'd be shot. <laughs> Just the, that Victorian mannerism coming from Europe and that type of uh, unethical, <laughs> you know how they thought in that time period of uh, cutting you with a big blade is not ethical. You know, you can actually, there's, there's like, if they read about minimal bayonet wounds in the Civil War, there's, there's not that many saber wounds either. Most of the time when you clashed with somebody, you were trying to unhorse them. And I imagine the guys who got the most saber wounds were infantrymen that were trying to run away, like, and artillerymen that were getting whacked at in that respect. But, uh, yeah, they still had that, that Victorian principle of honor and, and chivalry versus... I know myself, I would have went in with my pistol blazing instead of out there trying to hack at somebody with a... The thing that you have to get in, in really in, and really get away from the Hollywood aspect of Civil War cavalry is the fact that 80% of Civil War cavalry was fought on foot. Here at Gettysburg, the first day, John Buford fought on foot. The third day over there in the East Cavalry Battlefield, where Custer and the rest was mounted charges. And, uh, but that was just a very short time period, but 80% of the cavalry fighting was done like it was just a big method of getting you to the battle. And <laughs> when, when Buford was here, he complained initially about not being able to, uh, you know, get enough forage for the horses and stuff. Wouldn't just going out into a field be sufficient? I mean, what did they really need to uh, be healthy? You needed grain. What type of grains would that be? Any any type of grain? Okay. But you, you have to figure, think about when we have like a drought like we're having right now. The grass is very minimal. And like we were just talking about these guys getting coughing and carrying on from this stuff here because it's so dry that they were trying to eat. But at that time period, there were so many horses here and so much that it was all being eaten. Although Buford was here first. So they, I don't know how, why they would have had a lack of forage here. There certainly should have been a lot of grass and stuff around. But he was stuck on a line. When you're stuck where you're at, you can't just go out looking for a... The would clover uh, be a good food source at all? Okay. This guy loves poison ivy. <laughs> I'd be a big apple person. I'm trying to find a